Hi, and welcome to episode 26 of Understanding Dark Table. As promised in this episode, we are going to look at the filmic module. This is one of two new modules in Darktable 2.6, and what it's designed to do is to give a filmic look to your images, hence the name. So the idea is to try and mimic what analog film would have done had you shot on analog film rather than shot on digital. So let's dive right on in and have a look. Now, there are three things that should be on your checklist to do before you think about activating the filmic module. Number one, get the white balance right. If for any reason the white balance is not exactly where it should be, you really want to correct that before you go anywhere. For the female members of the audience, my apologies for this appalling image. I know it must be terribly frustrating to have to look at this and listen to my voice at the same time. This is Nat. He's a great male model. I've shot with him on a few occasions in Sydney. Uh, when he lived in Sydney, he's moved away now, but he's a great guy. He was such fun to work with. Uh, we shot this in an abandoned power station. It was a lot of fun. And because I shot this, with a flash white balance because I was lighting him with off-camera flash I don't feel a need to tweak the white balance so that part of it is okay. The second thing is the exposure. Uh, in this instance I'm reasonably happy with where the exposure is sitting so I'm not going to adjust that but if you're working on an image where the exposure could have maybe been a little bit better if there's some clipped highlights that you can pull back into range do so with the exposure module before you get to the filmic module. Thirdly, demosaic. This appears in the basic group and it doesn't have an on off switch. And the reason for that is because when you're working with digital images, they all need to be demosaiced because of the way a Bayer filter works in your sensor. I'm not gonna go into the mechanics of that, but demosaic is always running. Now, by default, it chooses this PPG method, which is the fastest demosaic algorithm that your computer can apply. However, Aurelien Pierre, the guy who wrote the filmic module, he's written a great blog post, by the way. I'm probably going to talk about it quite a lot in this video, and it'll be linked in the notes down below. Definitely go and read it, even if you're not technically minded. If you are technically minded, you're going to love it. Even if you're not technically minded, have at least a brief skim through it because he really goes into detail on what all of the controls do in the filmic module. But he recommends that you use the Amaze demosaic algorithm and use it with color smoothing. Now, I'm just going to go with one time and match greens. I'm just going to go local average. And because I'm going to need this over and over again, I'm actually going to save that as a preset. So I'm going to store as a preset, I'm going to call it filmic, just so that whenever I plan on using the filmic module, I can come over to the demosaic module, select the preset filmic, and it's all done for me. Now I've got to admit, if I zoom into this at 100%, I can't really tell the difference between those two demosaic algorithms, like the default PPG or my new filmic preset. I honestly can't see a difference, but the recommendation is go with the Amaze algorithm with color smoothing before you go to the filmic module. So we've ticked off our three things. Now we can get into the filmic module and have a look. So where do we start with the filmic module? Well, I think a good place to start is with this auto-tune levels. Now what that will do by clicking on this eyedropper is filmic will analyze the entire image and basically set all of these parameters for us on what it thinks is the correct approach for this image. Let's give it a go. Oh, ye gods, no, no wrong not what i wanted <laughs> but hey it's an algorithm it's not perfect and i'm just going to switch that off 
and I'm going to hit reset because that is not what I wanted from, from this image. Reset. Let's try that again. So, we've got this middle grey luminance. Now you've heard the idea of 18% grey. Our mid-tones should be an 18% grey. So what we want to do is drag this middle grey luminance to a point such that our histogram is basically sitting across the middle of the graph. So, drag. Nope, going the wrong way. Let's go the other way. All the way up to there. That's way too far. Let's just bring it back. We're looking for the middle. Probably about there. That's our starting point. You know, we can come back and tweak it later, but that's a good starting point. Next, we want to set the white relative exposure. The number of stops between middle grey and pure white. Now, essentially what you're doing with this slider is trying to get the right hand edge of the histogram data to reach to the right hand side of the graph. So, we will simply grab this, that's too far, bring it back, now we're too low, and we're just going to slide it out to about there. Now, I've come up with a value of 3.69 EV. We could click on the little eyedropper tool beside the white relative exposure slider and see what the filmic module believes is the correct white relative exposure value. So we'll click on that. Wow, it's come up with 3.66. Pretty much where I was at, so that's great. Turn that off. Next up, we've got the black relative exposure. If we read the tooltip, number of stops between middle grey and pure black. Now, the white relative exposure is pretty technical. We basically wanted to push the data as far to the right of the histogram as we could without clipping. With the black relative exposure, it's a little more subjective, creative, call it what you will. It really comes down to what you want in terms of contrast, how much you want to crush the blacks and crush those shadows. So again, we grab this and we drag it until we find a value that we like. For me, I want those shadows to be reasonably dark. I'm thinking, yeah, around about minus seven, roughly. Let's click on the eyedropper and see what Filmic thinks. Minus 6.8, okay, fair enough. I'll go with that. Not going to argue. So now we've got a basic look to our image. Now, what Filmic is trying to do, as I said at the outset, is to emulate the look of film. And what it does is it desaturates the extremities. So the deep shadows and the bright highlights it tries to push those subtly towards pure black and pure white rather than allowing saturated colors to get right down into the bottom corners of the and top corner of the graph so it subtly desaturates the extremities but leaves the midtones as they are so let's now look at this second section the filmic s curve We've got a contrast slider, which we'll come back to. I want to look at this latitude slider. The latitude is the values that are enclosed between these two nodes in the middle of the graph. So by default, two stops of exposure in the midtones are protected they are not affected by all of these things that we are doing with these sliders. So the latitude is the range of values in the mid-tones which don't get tweaked. So if we want to protect more of the mid-tone values, we can bring the latitude up. And as you can see, as you bring that value up, the gap in between these two nodes gets wider. All right, we bring it up. It stretches further apart. As we bring it down, they move back closer together. So remember, that's defining the range of mid-tone values which are protected from the filmic module. Next, we've got the balance and shadows highlights. 
What this allows us to do is move these two middle points, these two nodes in the middle of the graph, up or down. And basically what we're trying to do is get those two nodes equidistant from the center of the graph. So as we move this way, they both move up. As we move to the right, they both move down. So we want to get them generally equidistant from the middle, right? So now we've done that. The saturation control allows us to choose how much desaturation occurs to the extremities of the image. Now, when you get to extreme values, this will start to impact the midtones. So as we bring this down, we can see that the deep shadows are becoming more monochrome, as are our highlights. And when you get below about 5%, you will get some really nasty banding between saturated and desaturated, as we can see in Nat's chest here. But as we bring that up, you can see that there's not much desaturation happening in the midtones, but there is desaturation happening in the deep shadows and in the highlights. Now, just below that, there is this preserve chrominance checkbox. This is horrid. I don't know why you would use this. If we switch that on, it protects the chrominance values from the raw data. Now, to me, that is just horrid. I don't know why anyone would want to do that. Sure, it makes his skin look more tanned, but the blue in the jeans is just over the top. I really am not sure why you would want to do that. I'm guessing that if you were choosing to preserve the chrominance, it would be because you were planning on doing further color work in other modules that are dedicated to, you know, modifying color values within an image. Uh, so for me, that's a definite no-no. Okay, so let's just come back to this contrast slider. What that allows us to do is control the angle of the slope of that protected range. So as we move it one way, that range gets sort of flattened out a little bit towards the horizontal. And as we go the other way, it gets steepened a little towards vertical, but it is very gradual. And I guess you would use that in conjunction with the balance shadows and highlights to try and get that middle section of the curve as equally spread around the center point of the graph as you possibly could. It would be determined by things like the white relative exposure and black relative exposure. Next up, we've got intent. Now, the tooltip says, change this method if you see reversed contrast or faded blacks. What I have come to realize from my experiments with the filmic module over the last week is the only time you would reach for this intent drop down is if you've overcooked the values in these sliders. Because if you've followed Aurelian's instructions in his blog post and observed how these sliders are meant to be used, you should never encounter reversed or faded, you know, reversed contrast or faded blacks. So my general feeling uh, after only a week admittedly of using this is that if you need to reach for the intent drop down you've overcooked these values up here so you probably want to go back and tweak some of these parameters next up we've got the destination display now i've flicked through the blog post and what this is here to do is to allow you to customize the output device intent, basically. So if you are exporting the image to a device which has a limited gamut or display range of luminances, you can tweak those values here in the filmic module before you export the image. Now, I'm gonna to confess to not knowing enough about 
how monitors are calibrated and how you would work out what the display range of a given device was so I'm really not going to touch that my apologies if you wanted me to I'm sorry I just don't know enough and I'm not going to claim that I do so let's just move right on after that we're pretty much down to the stuff we already know which is the blend options if you you know want to limit the filmic module to certain areas of the image then you know you can use drawn masks or parametric masks or a combination thereof to define a portion of the image to say no i just want the filmic module to affect this part of the image and nothing else okay so let's just move on to another image this is a an image from another photo shoot that i did this was a bonnie and clyde shoot and matthew was my clyde and we shot in a studio on a black backdrop i printed off some fake money uh, and i brought this steel bar because i thought that just looked mean the idea of this guy who was a you know nasty gangster carrying around a steel bar was just kind of really threatening and nasty and i did have a, a bonnie on this shoot but i just chose this one image from the shoot to play around with so as you can see from the history stack we're right back to basics there's no base curve applied so first of all we look at our white balance again i shot with a flash white balance so i don't need to tweak that exposure it could probably come up a little bit looking at this uh, histogram here so i might just throw in two thirds of a stop yep that's probably enough and we'll go over to our demosaic and we'll just go with our filmic preset and now we can jump back and have a look at the filmic module so i'll start with the middle gray i want to bring all this up so we're roughly in the center about there now that has made the image look pretty washed out but that's okay that's just where we're starting the white point we want to shift that to the right hand side of the graph so we'll just bring that over to there our black point i'm gonna crush those shadows right down to about there and i need to bring up these two points so that they're more in the middle there let's bring those up a little i'm just going to protect a little bit more of that mid-range shift those up a little bit further that's actually looking pretty good that's pretty close to what i'd want i think now i did mean to go and do some noise reduction on this because this is an image that was shot with my a850 and we can see there's quite a bit of noise in there uh, i should have probably done that a little earlier but that's okay non-local means i want to set this to a lightness and i then want a second module i'm not going to explain all this because i explained this in the video on noise reduction so if you don't know what i'm doing go back and watch that video we're setting this to chroma and that's done a pretty decent job of cleaning up some of that noise i'm actually feeling like there's a little bit of blooming happening off the shirt here because that's very close to overexposed and because there's such high contrast between the shirt and the black background i'm actually thinking i want to pull that down a little bit in the filmic module because i feel like it's just a little bit overcooked so let's just back that off there we go that's a little better right now I'm going to leave that image right there i mean obviously i would go in and i'd crop and i'd do a few other bits and pieces but that's my approach for the filmic module on that image okay there's probably a heap more i could cover but hopefully this has given you an introduction to the filmic module like i said i've only spent a week with it so i don't claim to know every aspect of what it does or what it can do again i highly recommend you go and check out aurelian's blog post because that really will fill in all the blanks for you 
uh, but hopefully this has at least given you an introduction to the module and what it's capable of. I've got to say, I really like it and I can see myself using this over the tone curve module and the bass curve module a lot. And according to Aurelian, the global tone mapping module. This kind of replaces all three of those and does a really nice job in my opinion. I'm not a great fan, or certainly in what I've seen, of the auto uh, filmic mode. To me, it overcooks things a little bit, but at least it gives you an idea of what the module's trying to do. But I do think you really need to tweak it by hand. I have heard people mention that in Darktable 2.6, there is now an option in preferences to not auto apply base curves and I think that is because of the presence of the filmic module. So if you imagine that the filmic module is going to become a core part of your workflow you probably do want to go into preferences, core options and scroll right down to the bottom and make sure auto apply per camera base curve presets is unchecked. Alrighty that is going to do it for this one. So now that we've covered that, I can talk about some other bits and pieces. A couple of people had noticed that the video camera that I've been shooting these videos of, of my head with, uh, which is a beautiful little JVC, I don't have it sitting here, I would have grabbed it and shown it to you, but it's a, a lovely 3CCD JVC Handycam and it's probably about 10 years old now, but it's a great little camera, but it had a couple of dead pixels. And sadly, they were showing up really nastily on the wall up here behind me, and it just looked terrible. So for this video, uh, I did think about trying to shoot it with my a7 III. The problem with the a7 III is the screen on the back, whilst it does come out and allow you to tilt and whatnot it doesn't tilt far enough to do a selfie mode so if i was looking down the barrel of the lens you know if i if i put the a7 III on the tripod here i'm looking into the barrel of the lens but i've got no idea how wide the field of view would have been and how much i was getting so i elected not to do that and what i'm doing is just shooting this with my mobile phone uh, as you've probably worked out, I don't use the camera audio for my dialogue. I have a lav mic on my chest and that records to somewhere else and I sync it all up later. But hopefully, yeah, the phone looks okay. All right, I think that will do it for this video. I'm sure there was something else I was going to mention, but I can't think what it was right at this point in time. Um, Thank you for all the mad love that's come in. I've just been overwhelmed by the response to the last video, the new features in Darktable 2.6. My number of subscribers has gone up 25% in a week. It's just been crazy. Uh, I was sitting at somewhere around about 400 subscribers before that video came out, and I'm at almost... 580 as I'm recording this so obviously that video was something that the internet was waiting for and uh, it's eclipsed all other videos in terms of views so great that people are finding value in what I'm doing and um, thanks for the support I really appreciate it all right that'll do it talk to you soon